meeting workshop is called to order. Uh, for public comments, we've got one, but it'll wait until we see what we do with uh, one of the agenda items. And we're going to start with number five, the water treatment plan annual update. We've already got her in place. She's been here about three times already. Third time's charm, man. Let's get this over with. <laughs> yes, and I voted. <laughs> oh, good for you. Um, we're going to talk about the Guthrie Water Treatment Plant, and as uh, most of you all know, some may not, that the, the new plant was completed in 2011, and it's a state-of-the-art uh, water treatment plant. We have four employees that uh, work in that plant, or work out of the plant. Lee Pierce is our superintendent. He is uh, over two water operators and a, um, what's the other one? A collections operator. <laughs> find, my, find my notes here. <laughs> and these employees <coughs> are responsible for making sure that our water meets EPA, ODEQ, and Oklahoma State Health Department standards. The water treatment plant employees are responsible for the production of safe, pleasant tasting, and abundant supply of domestic and commercial needs for our water, as well as for our fire protection. The superintendent holds four licenses, <coughs> and all C licenses for water operator, wastewater operator, water lab, and wastewater lab. He has 12 years at, with the water treatment plant and 20 years with the city. So he's been here a while and understands how we operate. These four employees are on call 24 hours a day. The, water, the three plant operators rotate weekends and holidays so they're manned that uh, plant for seven days a week. And the collections operator, he's on call just as needed 24 hours a day. The duties and responsibilities of these employees entail um, monthly operating reports for DEQ, for the uh, Oklahoma State Health Department of Fluoride Monitoring Report, Tier 2 Hazard or Chemical Inventory Report for ODEQ, Consumer Confidence Reports for ODEQ, and Water Usage Reports for OWRB, Oklahoma Water Resources Board. They perform and analyze 52 lab tests per day. Ensure that the new requirements and mandates from these regulatory agencies are in place. They evaluate the treatment process daily to ensure that quality, ensure the quality and control. They maintain the chemical and backup equipment inventory. They perform general maintenance and repair on plant equipment, which includes pumps, motors, and gearboxes, and they make operational changes based on the laboratory analysis. The collection operator conducts the dead-end line flushing. We have 120 dead-end lines that have to be flushed on a regular basis. That helps keep the water moving in those lines, and it affects the taste and the, uh, <coughs> the color of the water. They, he collects samples uh, for the Langston University system. They conduct uh, preventive maintenance on program and all equipment valves at the treatment plant, the pump stations, and the towers. And they backwash as many as four filters each day based on laboratory analysis. We'll talk about the budget now. The water treatment plant has a total budget of $625,003. Personnel services um, take up about $209,556. And material and supplies take up $350,737. Of that, of that figure, $335,637 goes for chemicals. That's quite a lot. And the other services and charges that um, are included in that 
lump sum there is the um, calibrations, computer maintenance fees, equipment, licenses, certifications, and other maintenance charges that might come up. And that totals like $64,700. The 2015 budget in comparison to the four, 2014 uh, fiscal year budget only increased by 3% this year. We were quite proud of that. The increases address the annual merit raises for the employees and the chemicals and supplies increases. The debt service for the water treatment plant totals $1.3 million annually. The Langston water line and the automatic meter reading system has an annual payment of $296,000. And uh, we have challenges to boot. <laughs> We've got elevated water towers that and stand pipes that are an increasing concern. The maintenance of these, stru maintenance of these structures have been avoided. Uh, because of the high cost of the rehabilitation <coughs> and at some point in time we're going to have to address this. Any questions? We good to go? I'm good to go. Good job. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. All right. Next was, we're going to go back to number three, discussion regarding an entrepreneurial zoning designation. Okay. very much. Um, what we're talking about tonight uh, stems from one of your council goals for 2015. Uh, that goal being create and enhance the value of the local economy through progressive business development initiatives. What we're talking about is introducing the first uh, zoning criteria targeted directly at entrepreneurs and small businesses. Uh, what this would basically mean would uh, be any uh, any land that is designated as entrepreneurial or CE-1, uh, they would have to meet a certain criteria and prove that they are a small business or uh, entrepreneurial uh, initiative in order to uh, locate on that land. Um, to kind of give you some background, what we're, what we're seeing in economic development, and uh, I think it's pretty obvious, uh, the, the smokestacks aren't aren't really popping up anymore. Those those manufacturing jobs are a little bit different. Those manufacturing jobs are a little bit more tech-based, uh, and there's not quite as many uh, of those traditional jobs as what you've seen. So uh, the the tech industry uh, it, it stems through everything. There's there's ag tech. There's biotech. Um, there's you know the the app, the people who create the apps that are uh, on your cell phones, and so that that tech industry is really really uh, boosting off, and uh, that's kind of replacing uh, manufacturing a little bit. But the the amount of jobs aren't there. Um, what what we've also seen is entrepreneurs succeed in all climates. Down in down climates, people are um, desperate for uh, job creation, those kinds of things, and so they're taking risks. Uh, in in uptick climates you see people uh, feeling comfortable enough to go out and launch their own businesses as well. So uh, going after entrepreneurs, it, it does cast a wide blanket, but targeting them specifically in a, uh, in a designated area, it's a, it's a cultural incentive that they, that they feel like they can bounce uh, ideas off of their neighbors and everything like that. Uh, we expect a lot of media attention. Uh, we've, we've gotten some help from our friends with the Department of Commerce and Great, Greater Oklahoma City Partnership in developing this. Um, they they've also uh, kind of got us uh, in the right direction. If we if we do present this as a uh, as a final ordinance and you got, and the council approves it, uh, they've they've uh, kind of given us the pathway to talk to several different media outlets, Forbes, uh, Entrepreneur.com, uh, Business Week, to to get Guthrie's name and brand out there as an entrepreneurial destination. Um, Oklahoma is known as a great uh, location and a great destination for startups already. Oklahoma City was ranked the top market to launch a business. Um, Oklahoma itself is the uh, number one state for uh, uh, low-cost business startups as well. So um, 
that's kind of what we're uh, looking to do is designate this zoning criteria dedicated towards entrepreneurs and small businesses. Again, it's, it's led by council's goal to uh, enhance the value of the local economy through those progressive business development initiatives. So um, I'm going to open it up to any questions. I'll, I'll tell you uh, right now kind of what we're looking to do. Next step moving forward is come back to you to establish this ordinance in a few in, a, in the coming weeks. Uh, two couple of questions. Okay. Uh, then is this when an entrepreneur, or somebody comes in, they can pick a spot and say, "We want to be zoned this," or are you still looking at the eighty acres? Uh, the eighty acres would be a uh, great idea for this. I think that's uh, you know it's kind of what uh, I think a lot of the community feels is kind of a primary job uh, right. destination. So if, if you well. zone that CE one or whatever this is. Mm -hmm. Will that pre prevent anybody else from going out there? Um, it, it wouldn't necessarily prevent uh, prevent anyone from coming out there. Uh, we can tell them kind of what we're uh, what we were looking to do with it, uh, and if they, and if it's not something that they really fall into, we can talk about kind of uh, strengths and weaknesses of changing this again. Um, one thing that uh, the 80 acres presents is we I, I think. Uh, most of you are familiar with the Bar S deal that uh, fell through years ago. Um, a lot of that, well, 90, 99.9% .9 of that was due to the, um, the neighbors around there feeling very threatened about odor. Uh, mm -hmm. These are very non-threatening jobs. Uh, the, the entrepreneurs, like I said, they're not the smokestack generators. Uh, they're they're non-threatening to the, to the neighborhood. And maybe, Randall, you can discuss the legal side of that. So let's say, because I, I asked the same question the mayor did, is what mm -hmm. if someone comes in that is not uh, Dell Manufacturing, mm -hmm. knocks on our door and says, we wanna, we're want to we going to put 180 high-paying jobs right there at that corner. What would we do then, let's say hypothetically, if, if the 80 acres was a CE1, the city owns the acreage, what, what would happen then? You'd rezone it, to, mm -hmm. and and you don't have to rezone the whole eighty acres CE one. You can zone a part of it. Mm -hmm. So we could do the same thing with the CE one. Just make one end of it until we need it later on. You could, if you want instead to. of doing the whole eighty at one time, just in case, or do that, or if a Dell came or something like that, you go back in and rezone it, it to the use they want. Well, another thing that we're looking at too, um, in order to prevent something like that from happening, where we would have to go back and you know flip flop, um, is if they show kind of a dedication towards entrepreneurial development. If they give their staff some time during the week for creative initiatives, those kinds of things, um, you know, we we think that that would be still in support of entrepreneurs as well. Is this more or less to just establish this designation mm -hmm. rather than to? Yes. Designate right. Yes. Correct. Okay. Uh, in order to designate, uh, for instance, the 80 acres as a CE-1, mm -hmm. we would have to go through uh, a public hearing from the planning commission. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have to give about 30 days notice of that okay. public hearing but, as well. But we have to have it established before we can even go down that road. Right. Okay. Well, this is just it's establishing just a, a new type right. of zoning right. that we don't actually have. Well, I think it's great. Now, is that a good type of zoning to, to have? Uh, is that something that is people are looking for now? Uh, the the culture itself, um, we uh, we heard from uh, IEDC's kind of guru for International Economic Development Council. Sorry, uh, their guru of entrepreneurship. She said that the culture is one of the biggest incentives that a community can provide. And so when we're talking about being the only community in America and even the world that has the the, the strength to say your neighbors are like-minded individuals. You know, you can you can put them in a co-working space. You can put them in a uh, small business incubator. But when you actually designate a zone, a piece of land zoned towards entrepreneurs, it's a it's a great incentive for them. It gives them a little bit more freedom as well. Anybody else? Any questions? I do the idea. Is there have we looked at any other potential areas that we would look in the future? I mean, I know this is very preliminary, but other areas in the community that we've kind of pseudo-identified that... The, the armory has kind of uh, taken a, a little bit of a attention towards this as well. Okay. Um, I know course, Google will fit right in the armory. Yeah, Google will fit right in the armory. We can go up. Yeah. If a landowner uh, yeah. sees that it's <laughs> successful, we would obviously uh, take a look at their case for um, rezoning their, 
their area. Okay. No, I'm just curious if we hadn't thought about other areas. I mean, obviously you have. But yeah, I'm going to scan an article and send it to you all on Friday, but you know, the ICMA Public Management International Magazine this month really, really has a great article about manufacturing and how in the 2000s, you know, we lost in the United States one third of all manufacturing jobs to overseas competition. The peak of manufacturing was 1979. We've watched a, a steady decline um, until now. What cities are now competing for is um, innovation. They're not competing for smokestacks. They're competing for, um, instead of smokestack chasing, we call it innovation chasing. Well, so in my understanding, that this is exactly how the research triangle started in North Carolina mm -hmm. as well. And this so, is based off of the North Carolina research. Yeah, and exactly. so it's, um, and, it, and it is. I mean, when we go to economic development conferences, it's, it's about creating um, good schools, good physical environments, good sense of community. Um, we're competitive on wages in Oklahoma. Um, and, you know, to be real frank, we're competing with other cities right now in Oklahoma for, for these kind of jobs. And I think it's a great way to go out and go out and be able to say, this is our council's direction, which is very innovative and um, very progressive. Does that extend to the airport? Yeah. Or are we so that mean, we crowded out there? I mean, I, it's an excellent question. Um, it could. If we had as built at the airport right now, mm -hmm. we would be able to respond to probably about six six RFPs. We had hangers built. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. That's just what I'm saying. That innovative design. I mean, that innovative. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the spinoff is a great idea for. For aviation, one of the businesses that we had uh, been courting for uh, quite a while uh, ended up in Frisco, Texas. But uh, they really, really love the idea of being. Um, what's, it's the it's the bait bait shop right next to the airport uh, on the on the south side. They are on the north side. Uh, they really love the. I think they had sixty plus acres uh, right next to the airport as well. So the airport is obviously a destination that we would want to take a look at. Yeah, um, again, my uh, my my goal is to get uh, kind of a formal proposal to you guys in the next coming in the upcoming weeks and um, and get this on the council agenda. Cool. So, if you have questions about the draft, keep the draft. Shoot it to me. Any concerns? Thank you. Thank you. We'll move to item number four, discussion regarding Territorial Square's lease agreement. Um, this is kind of John's bag. Door number two. Door number two. So, last council meeting we had on the agenda the renewal of the lease with the territorial squares and it was tabled with the idea that we, we, we would explore amending the, the, uh, the lease with the territorial squares on the Girl Scout building to have um, get out of exclusive use and be non-exclusive use, meaning that we could use that building for other things. And so uh, what what we did is uh, talk, did a little bit of talk with the uh, territorial squares with Phyllis, and she'll have an opportunity to talk also Phyllis Johnson, the president of the squares, to see if they'd be receptive to that, and they were. And so, uh, based on that, I, I just put together a real quick little bullet point, if, if you will, that hopefully everybody has in their packets of, of what a recommendation might be to be worked out in terms of amending that agreement. And what we would uh, like to include is uh, it, it, that it be a, inclusive, allowing, as, as, as uh, Councilman Wood had expressed earlier, about having the ability for, for uh, a party or an individual to have a, a bridal shower or a, a wedding party or that type of thing there to uh, to utilize that building. So what we're suggesting is is that the city would uh, schedule and collect fees, and we follow the model that we use currently for Highland Hall. And essentially, people um, will can make a reservation by calling the city or even online, I believe, and 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 then they have to come and put down a cleaning uh, deposit and then their rental fee. And then ultimately, uh, I think a day or two before their event, they come and they get the key, and, and away we go. 
and so that would be what we would suggest and then you know with you know, the territorial squares agreement that we would pers pursue that so the city would be doing the scheduling the city would be collecting the money and, yeah. and the idea also that I, I guess I didn't have on here would be that they would still have the exclusive use of if I understand correctly and correct me if I'm wrong Phyllis I think you guys meet on the first Saturday second, second, second Saturday, fourth Saturday. Saturday fourth Saturday okay yes. So they would have exclusive use for for that for, their, for, their, for their for their usage. So roof is still leaking. I was going to say for maintenance. How are we going to uh, work that? Is it still well, the it would fall under the same uh, process we would use then for Highland Hall. I mean, the okay. structure itself is our structure, or the city's structure. Okay. Um, uh, typically, uh, if someone rents Highland Hall. That's part of having the deposit down. So if they ruin something, why, you know, hopefully the deposit will cover it. Um, recognizing that that building, if you will, or or that structure right now today doesn't have, from the city's perspective, it's empty. Meaning we don't have tables and chairs, and it's a square dance hall. <laughs> so it's pretty empty. So, um, but if something were to get ruined, or you know, there, we we would, or if it's not cleaned up. You know, from a from a party, and and we'd follow the same rules and regulations that we have for Highland Hall in terms of you know the alcoholic beverages and tobacco and all that, all those those same regulations and rules. And you said you talked to them, and they're. I initially talked with Phyllis about the openness of of them going from an exclusive agreement to in, inclusive agreement. They said that they would be open to that, and so with that nod then I put together what you have today I haven't had I do know they're having a meeting November 8th I think next Saturday yes, and, and so they um, need something to go she to she needs something to go to probably to her group with to say yay nay or whatever so well I think again the whole deal is we I think we tried to push them toward the direction of Highland Hall anyway so we'd have just one thing the city needs to get out of the rental business that building's old, needs a roof here before too long, depending on the weather and what it does to it. It does. So, uh, I think if they're willing to do this, that'll let them stay there for a little bit more. But that way we can also use it, if Highland Hall's booked and somebody else wants to do something, we can use that, mm -hmm. that building. And they would just have to secure their equipment probably better than they do now. Um, something whatever but I think we ought to work with this anybody got any other questions or concerns I just asked we don't have any bridal showers you know honestly it, it probably won't be a high um, demand location yeah. because there's no cha tables or chairs and we did not include it in the budget to buy tables or chairs so I can't imagine um, hey I've been wrong before but yeah. I can't imagine we're gonna have a line out the door asking to rent it yeah, but not unlike the pavilion at Mineral Wells Park that folks rent, we, we... Yeah, but there might be some small groups around that we may be able to utilize it for something. Just uh, need something in there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other city clubs that would participate in it? I mean, are there... there may be. I mean, you know, yeah. like Lions or, you know, if... if, if yeah, civic clubs need a place to meet. So they, they, like they all pay they love usually to go somewhere. The, the deal is that getting a meal to them, but a lot of them cater it and they bring the meal to wherever they're meeting. So, so this is uh, Qantas does gauges, so they have a meal prepared there. But and Rotary has Granny had one over here. Yeah, no, but I'm just talking about any other smaller like you know Girl Scouts. I think Girl Scouts. That's the, the one garden group clubs, I think they of. do things all over. Yeah. yeah. Just something that if, we had to, if we had to put it out in our flyer that if sure. you wanted to use, you use kind of dance ideal hall. use a dance you could hall, have a dance. absolutely. Any yeah. kind of dance doesn't have to be. Yeah, yeah. And and like I've said before, when we've had these discussions, we don't want to do see do around the issue. We, we're not do see doing, Trey. Not do see doing. We're throwing it right into the. You've been waiting. You've been waiting all day. What I saw it on the agenda tonight. Yeah, you can say it. It's been sitting right back. Yeah, I've been dealing with that for four years.
<laughs> you want to talk to us? Anything you need to say? I apologize. Or if you do, you need to go up there. But if you're happy with this, we'll take that too. So. Uh, okay. Oh, well, like Jim said, you know, I definitely need to take this back to, to our group. Uh, one of the concerns that, that we had talked about was it being, uh, not being American disabled uh, compliant. ADA, yeah. And that was an issue that, that we were concerned about if somebody got hurt. Uh, we have insurance on our group, uh, but we were concerned about what happened if somebody else got hurt. And ahead, I, I uh, addressed, since you and I talked, I guess Phyllis, I hadn't gotten back to you on that uh, specifically, but I did talk to Ramble and I also talked to Jim Hankey, our uh, building inspector, and essentially with that, uh, we're not looking at new construction, it's old construction, and so that is not a current concern for, for us or the city or renting it, so we're okay with that. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, and I have thought. Um, and we we rented Highland Hall for our right. last big dance, and we want to do it again, just to put a, a little bug in, in your ear for next January. Um, and there was things that were locked up. Are we going to have the ability to lock our doors? We've got some like decorations and and stuff in closets. Are we going to be have that ability to do that? I don't see any reason why not. I mean, no again, on the Highland Hall model, it's used Monday through Friday with the uh, home delivery meals and the meals that are done there, and, and on the weekends we rent it. And they they lock they they too cool bar the doors so that nobody can get into their equipment or their office supplies, and so. Yeah. yeah, I think all that would uh, probably need to be done, we can talk later, is just work out a, you, know, you guys just need to get a lock and a key. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, we, we do have, and we do understand that we have a, a contract through 2017, and this is just an amendment, I gather, to that, or is this going to totally change the lease and... I guess uh, my suggestion to the council would be to have Randall, our attorney, draft a new agreement or addendum to the current agreement and that it would still continue. Amendment to your current agreement. Okay. Okay. As opposed to redoing the whole thing. Okay. All right. Um. <laughs> <laughs> You're limiting me, aren't you? <laughs> so. We have concerns about the additional cost of utilities. The utilities are paid by territorial squares, and anybody that uses the facility right. will be using utilities that we will be responsible for. I'd like to know how that would be handled. That's a great question. Yeah. yeah. Now, do we need to break it down per use? Mm. I mean, a fee schedule for... That's probably what we'd have to do is prorate it based on use, and if there's no use, it'll be just like it is now. And if there's use, we'll have to prorate it for the days that it's used. Okay. Yeah. Part of this will just have to be some learning as we go through it to see, you know, looking at time and all that. Oh, sure. Yeah, sure. And, and, and we we definitely want to work. We're, we're not trying to... to Yes, we love our little club, <laughs> but uh, and we want, but we want to work with you guys. I mean, it's not like we're we're trying to be hard nosed about anything. Well, and I think again, we hadn't talked and we got an agreement, you know. I, but I know, you know, you folks do have a caretaker out there that does take care of the the property per se, and so uh, I'm sure the same could be, you know, as we s sit and talk. You know, I mean, keeping the lights out. You know, we've got a caretaker that can maybe do a few things to help to help the whole agreement as well, mm -hmm. to not burden anybody with additional costs yet. Okay. I think that's it, and I will, after Saturday's meeting, then I will get back, I guess, with Jim, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. 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 Thank
I'm just looking at the square dance terms. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Saturday. Yes. More intelligent. I'm the only one. And we've got a lot about that. Square dance. Okay. I'm not going to talk about square dance. We won't work. Okay. We're going to go to agenda number six for discussion regarding agenda items. Anybody have anything there that we can talk about here and here that we don't have to wait on? Andrew, you want to get on me if I start talking about who, uh, who we should appoint to these things? Or? Yeah, let's do that now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, we need to probably get rid of that. Take that uh, number seven, request for future items of discussion. Anything that... I'm going to get in trouble for that. No. <laughs> I have one thing. I know for the for for years and years we've kind of bantered back and forth about uh, possible location site locations for dog parks, things of that nature. Have we made any movement, or have we looked at? Yes, we have looked at that, and you know what? Um, it um, it's going to come up on a finance committee agenda more than likely okay. soon like in the next one. So let's start there and then see what that finance committee wants to do with it. All right. All right. I just, I know okay. we talked about it. And we have, and, and we've gone into some, uh, not engineering drawings or anything, but we've um, located sites for both a disc golf um, dog park, um, and now there's conversations about the elbow um, being used. Um, and right. so uh, I, I use that <laughs> loosely. I think everybody knows what that means, but the location that was formerly known as the my question is, how do we get over there? The elbow. elbow. How do we get there? Well, Hold on, I guess you use the square dance term. We get to split the room. And I'll, I'll go through the, <laughs> the, the finance star. committee. There's a um, there's a bridge program that's funded through um, a state department, and so it would be looking for um, grants to get a bridge um, okay. across. A walking a bridge? A walking, walking bridge. I was going to say, well, one yeah. that maybe flows with the river. <laughs> that beats to do yes. Yes. I like it. Yes. Yes, let's yeah. talk about that. All right. No, that's we'll all. Thank you. I just... Nothing else? Because we got to say it.